So as Ruth says, I'm Jerry, and I've got 24 hours left as Basra UK Chair. I'm really delighted to be spending some of that time in this session about poverty and the cost of living and critically what social workers can do about that. It's absolutely right that this is upfront and central to our conference. When I started as a social worker student 22 years ago, uh, my first placement was in a hospice and a really big part of my job was getting money for people because people need money. Um, and I've had a career long interest in that issue of um, choice and control that comes with people knowing what they need and what they want and not being able to, to fulfill that. Um, and I do see that as really central to our work. I'm going to introduce a couple of people um, and then let you know the format for the session. Kate Morris um, from the University of Sheffield isn't here today, but she has very kindly shared her slides with us. So I'm going to say a little bit about her um, because I'm going to be drawing on her work for some of the things that I'll be saying. So Kate is a social worker and professor of social work at the University of Sheffield. She's been very heavily involved in the child welfare inequalities research. Um, and she's also uh, one of um, what I might think of as the four musketeers who are the um, people who kind of really working on the transformation of children's services in England and how we can move from a punitive model to a much more social and embracing model. Uh, so um, Kate Morris, along with Sue White, Anna Gupta and Bruce Featherstone have written an absolutely brilliant book called Child Protection, a Social Model. And if you only read one book about children's services, that would be a good one to read. I'm also going to introduce Dominic, who will be speaking shortly. Um, you might know him as at Single Dads SW. Um, he's a social work student and also a person with living experience who has um, brought that living experience and his passion for tackling food poverty into real activism um, that we'll hear about shortly um, and into a food is care campaign, um, which I hope will be really inspiring to all of us. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context um, of poverty, cost of living and social work, hand over to Dominic to talk from his living experience and then it'll come back to me to introduce um, a bit about what Basra is doing, and we'll hear from Kerry Prince, who's our parliamentary officer. So in terms of the, the context, the child welfare inequalities research over the last decade has given strong messages that are unsurprising to social workers, that there's a persistent link um, between poverty and the struggles that families have and the harm that comes to children. And that's across all places. Um, Kate Morris talks about a complex relationship between poverty and struggles that children and families have. Um, some of that is direct. So, for example, children not being able to have the nutrition that they need or be able to get to school. But also the indirect impact of poverty, um, which causes family stress and also affects neighbourhood conditions, the environment that children and young people are growing up in. And Kate Morris says very clearly that that is not a background factor. It is persistent and present and live and real. Um, some of the work that she's recently done on a family study um, has heard from families about the impact for them. And there's a couple of really wonderful, um, evocative and important phrases that come from that. So the first is this um, idea of the dance of responsibility. And that's that toing and froing that happens between members of families and services to try to engage and get the things that they need. Um, and so he describes this as fragmented families and fragmented services. And the, one of the big problems that arises is that engagement issues, the, the struggle to get engagement and to get the help they need can sometimes be seen as resistance. The other phrase uh, that Sue White uh, uses is this one of entering the labyrinth. So families describing that when they ask for help, they find themselves in a maze, a complex journey, um, which may not actually result in the help that they need. So families talk about asking for help but getting an assessment. Um, and Sue White describes that as the difference between family's core business and services' core business and the mismatch that happens. Sue Morris has also done a lot of work around what the impact on social workers is of working with this wallpaper of practice that is poverty. Um, first thing that's really key in this is their feelings of powerlessness that transfer from families and children struggling with systems and struggles every day, coming into social workers' own reality as well, and the feeling that poverty is just too big to tackle. And the second is the moral 
just distress and the moral muddle that occurs when you want to acknowledge poverty, but it's not really acknowledged. Um, and you also don't want to suggest that people in poverty won't be able to parent well or to help their children to thrive. Um, and so the weight to give to it um, and how to bring that into the visibility becomes a real moral um, issue for social workers. So in terms of the context now, of course, we've had the COVID pandemic and we're still coming out of that. And that has exposed even more starkly the impact of inequality. Um, and so what is talked about needing to bring poverty clearly into our lens, the way that we look at what's happening with people. Um, and I think that relates very closely to the idea of using an intersectional lens and seeing not just people's characteristics and experiences, but also the systems that they work in and the oppression that is within those systems and the systems of oppression and how they overlap. So situating poverty very clearly within that. And we see that in the COVID pandemic because the loss and the struggle um, and impact was so much stronger and is so much stronger in deprived areas of our country. And that's linked to ethnicity, that's linked to jobs, that's linked to housing, that's linked to the environment. The other thing just to note in terms of the context is that although Sue White's work and her colleagues' work is largely around children and families, of course that includes children and adults and many generations. And we know um, that adults who are disabled, older people, unpaid carers, and many other of the groups and the, um, the situations that we're working with as social workers, poverty is very, very present. Of course, we're now going into cost of living crisis, where more and more people will find it harder and harder um, to either escape poverty or to, um, to draw themselves out of it if they are already living within that. Um, and we hear from social workers in Basra about the human rights issues that that is arising, um, that that is causing. So with this context in mind, I'm gonna invite Dominic to talk about his living experience um, and his activism, and then we'll come back to thinking more about what social workers can do about this. <coughs> Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Jerry and Ruth. And um, yeah, I was thinking walking here that, like, if someone had told me a couple of years ago I'd be here today, like, presenting to everyone in a lecture hall, I really wouldn't have believed it. And uh, yeah, especially the Basra Annual Conference 2022. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna discuss the Food Is Care campaign and how it was created. I'm gonna introduce a a new food fr framework that I hope will be like a game changer. Um, but I will start by introducing myself and some of the obstacles I've faced. Oh, wow. So yeah, um, I designed these slides. They look quite good. I've never seen them big. So that's, <laughs> quite, that's mad. But um, yeah, so I'm a single dad. Um, I live in the most deprived blocks of my council estate um, with my amazing daughter. And we survive off universal credit, uh, free school meal vouchers, child benefit, um, and yeah, the use of the food bank. Um, and yeah, I kind of like, when I started, I started just before COVID uh, studying social work. And like, I gradually, I kind of saw the, the synergies between the hardships that I've faced as a single parent in poverty and a lot of like the people that we serve. So my first placement was um, working at a local authority um, contracted semi-supported living scheme for what they would class as high risk children in care. They were aged between 16 and uh, 21. And all of the young people survived off um, like really limited state benefits um, and, and for their nutrition, it was all food donations from local businesses and trips to the food bank. And as the student social worker, like I'd take the children or young people to the food bank. And um, yeah, I'd be the one that would like facilitate that. And I, and I kind of, some, something didn't, it didn't seem right 
even at that early stage of just not really knowing still what social work really was, but trying to grasp it all, um, there was just something just didn't sit right with me. And then on Thursdays, they'd have what were choice foods delivered from Greg's Bakery because like they're easy to consume, they're already prepared. Um, and that was being used by the scheme as like a behavior controlling mechanism where if if the young people hadn't obeyed the um, like the rules of the scheme, if they'd come back late, if they're being caught drinking or something, they weren't um, allowed access to that, the, the Greg's um, Choice Bakery products. And, and it was, it was like, uh, it registered with me that there was this, and this is before nobody was talking about food insecurity in this country anyway, and I hadn't heard of it before, but it just registered with me how like their lack of access to nutrition was something that I was experiencing when, um, when like I was, uh, when I'd leave placement and go home. Um, because so, yeah, so that's me and my daughter, that's where we live. Um, and it's this idea, so where we live, the council state, there's one shop and it's, it's what's classed as a food desert. And I've put the quote there, um, where people do not have easy access to healthy, fresh foods, um, particularly if they're poor or have limited mobility. I hope everyone can hear me. But um, yeah, so that lack of access to nutrition was something I shared with the children in care. And it, it, was, it, it, was, it, was, it was something that challenged me on lots of levels. But it was also at the same time as I was experiencing some of the most intense food insecurity, I was working on placement for the local authority and we were receiving um, threats of homelessness, like notices seeking possession of our council, mine and my daughter's council flat, um, which would yeah leave us homeless. And that, that was really troubling. And it's something that I'm going to, it's an important point, I think, what it represents. And I'm going to, hopefully um, come back come back to it. So, um, yeah, so it's nearly uh, two years ago to the day, I think, that I first spoke, um, which was actually at the Basra 50th. Um, it was Emma and Jerry who invited me. And um, yeah, at that opportunity, I was just, because of COVID, my placement had come, COVID had just come in and my placement had come to an end. And I felt um, it important to use that the first little platform I got to um, to to argue that um, you know achieving food security for all service users needs to be an integral part of the future of social work. Um, and I think in the current cost of living crisis, like that statement um, has gained momentum, and yeah. I kind of, I didn't stop after I got that opportunity. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know, there's loads of um, amazing opportunities I got. Um, um, and Shahid from PSW Magazine has been like a, um, a continued support to kind of uh, let me feel like my voice can get out there. I've been um, quite central to Basra England's responses, especially in terms of kind of food insecurity and poverty regarding the care review. Um, and yeah, and so last year at Basra's um, 2021 conference, um, I got to speak as a student still. And um, there I was saying that um, the PCFs need, you know, food insecurity needs to be included um, in our professional capabilities, but not just Baswa, also the professional standards um, of Social Work England and the KSSs. So there's just, I don't know, a bit of background on some of the work I've done. I should have linked. And then in the past few months, I've had um, the opportunity uh, to speak on Sky News about the cost of living crisis. Um, there's lots here anyway, but if you get a chance um, or, or you're interested at all, um, that's all there. And I've teamed up with the Food Foundation who are doing great work. Oh, and I actually got to speak at a parliamentary event, like I think it was two weeks ago, about, um, you know, my experiences 
um, and building the Food is Care campaign, um, which was which was quite an experience. So um, what, what have I seen as the barriers to change, um, even through getting these opportunities? And I think it's important to note that there's no doubt that food has been like a blind spot of social work. Um, it hasn't been something, food insecurity hasn't been um, addressed, especially when I first started, which was you know prior to the amazing work of um, Rashford and everything. And I think the fact that, I think it should be reflected that, you know, the fact it's taking a single dad from a council estate to kind of request that these changes um, are made and like not senior policy makers, kind of, I've, I think speaks for itself. And I've experienced snobbery in social work on a number of levels, um, even to the point where there's been like a real reluctance um, that I've experienced to like acknowledge ideas that I've developed and it's felt like you know like your voice has a place but it's not to kind of exceed that place or um, or speak on you know practice guidance or policy or um, things like that but I would say that not to acknowledge like a voice of poverty is is going against our very like values and ethics um, and just, just to speak on this, because I think it's quite important to highlight, um, and it was just like last Thursday, we were speaking with senior um, practitioners about poverty and the cost of living, and it was, it, I get quite passionate about these issues, and it was said to me that, you know, I need to stand back, and I need to, you know, not take it personal, and I think, and it's something I'm going to work on, and like I'm, I'm happy to reflect on. Um, but I would highlight that when you're actually experiencing the inequalities that are being discussed, like it's hard for it not to be personal. Thank oh, thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure I was going to say that, so I'm glad I did now. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so what have I done, I think, I've tried to do to kind of shift the agenda. And so when I was getting these opportunities, I was, I was being um, asked like, oh, can you speak or write about, you know, your, your lived experience of poverty or your lived experience of being a single parent or your lived experience of, you know, food insecurity. And I'd be writing them and I'd be like so grateful that I've, you know, someone actually wants to listen or, or um, give me these chances. But after doing it a couple of times, I started to think like, but this isn't my lived experience. Like I'm in the council estate right now. I'm a single dad. I'm living in poverty. So it's where this idea I created and it's mentioned, um, coined in my book, which I got a couple of copies of here. Um, of a living experience and I think to take it further I think that lived experience is and I and I want to share this with you guys I think that lived experience is more of a comfortable idea for people to stomach because it's like the hardships already being completed um, and it can kind of be categor easily like categorized as that um, and I would I would go so far to say that organizations can, or however you want to read it, but they can use this idea of lived experience to kind of, when they want to appear as authentic or um, appear as inclusive, then they can, you know, provide people with lived experience. Um, well, yeah, as I said in my book, the, I've developed the idea of living experience, which stresses you know, the, the, the very tensions and the urgencies right now that are ongoing and that, you know, this isn't something historic that, um, you know, it's not a historical inequality, I should say, sorry, that has been, you know, um, uh, combated. It's something that is very present um, and ongoing. Um, and yeah, I, 
I'll just stress that I think there is such vital, this is not to say that there isn't so much that can be learned from people with lived experience, but I'll just give a quick example. So someone like Jack Monroe, who speaks about, you know, her, her experiences of food insecurity, but in like a historic sense. So she wouldn't be able to talk about how when COVID first came in, the government were using a company called Eden Red um, to distribute the uh, school food vouchers at the very beginning of COVID. This system and the company, I think they're French, I might be wrong, but the, our government, they, it, this system just didn't work. Um, I'd have to stay up till like two in the morning or set an alarm because the amount of traffic it was getting, um, you know, to apply for your um, food voucher for your child um, it just wasn't capable in it. It was a failing system. And some, so I would suggest that someone with only lived experience of uh, inequality like food insecurity wouldn't be able to give you that insight into the kind of mechanisms of um, that someone in poverty is experiencing. Oh yeah, and so I've, I've redefined um, uh, so the UN defined food insecurity and in my book I've kind of redefined it and the feedback I've got is kind of especially in terms of I've redefined it to place it in the domain of social work very much and also for it to be kind of accessible for an accessible idea for um, frontline practitioners. Um, so I define food insecurity as the living experience of food poverty. So this is our amazing guest who unfortunately couldn't be here. And yeah, massive salute, as Jerry said, to um, Paul Bywaters and the whole Child Welfare Inequalities Project. And um, this is Professor uh, Kate Morris, who's, um, this is her like widely cited offering that says um, poverty has become the wallpaper of practice, too big to tackle and too familiar to notice. And with this, Morris like establishes a much needing starting point. Um, but through, through the work I do, um, I continue to strip back the wallpaper um, and show the wall behind, which is a wall made up of bricks of um, food deserts, food insecurity, a dehumanizing benefit system, council housing that's just not fit for purpose, the cooker from the homeless charity, the bins that haven't been collected for months. And it's this, it's this reality that I think, and, and not just giving a nod to poverty existing, like understanding the actual intricacies and what the different dimensions that inflict on a person um, and their ability to flourish or a family. Um, and yeah, I would say all of these things can combine to make you, all of the, all of the hardships I've noted like they can combine to just make you feel hopeless, and like make the idea the idea of social mobility seem like unachievable, if if that's a word. Cool. Um, okay, this is the Food Foundation. So th uh, this is the most um, recent statistics, um, and it's that. I think it's just over 50% of house, and this is in the last six months, so it's really recent, 50% um, or nearly 50% of families on universal credit um, experience uh, food insecurity, which link into what Jerry highlighted and, um, and Morris and the CWIPs, um, you know, you're 10 times more likely to, you know, have state intervention if you, are living in um, poverty um, and social workers involved. This, in no uncertain terms, because I've fought this battle, I've, I feel for quite some time that, you know, food insecurity is um, part, should be, and is part of our practice. So, oh yeah, I've, I guess I don't have too long, so I'll whiz through. So food is care is both a concept to bring it into social work um, and also a campaign letting, um, the people in power know that poor, often single parent families in council estates are hungry 
um, and feel unheard. We, uh, I didn't know where to turn and I, shout, uh, and I reached out to Social Workers Union, so massive thanks for them who were instrumental in getting this survey done, which, is, um, which was in December and January of this year, 119 um, social workers. Are let, the, the results, it's, a, it's you know, the first of its kind ever to be done and the results speak for themselves. I don't have time to go through them, but I'm more than happy to share. Um, and with these results that I probably should have mentioned <laughs> in more detail, but um, I, I didn't stop there and I wrote letters um, to people in power being one, or people with influence, um, even to our very own roof, um, and to the Secretary of State for Education and Health and Social Care. And I think, yeah, I, and I got meetings, especially with Ruth, and um, it, did, it has had um, a bit of an impact, but unfortunately not on the care review. Um, so with the, with the care review, um, I'd, I'd, so I'd had confirmation that um, from them directly in response to my letter and in a meeting, that you know, food insecurity is going to be a key area of focus for the review. The review, as maybe we all know, has just recently been published, I think last week, and it doesn't mention food insecurity once. I will say that Nathan, William, and a care, a care lever, who in their stories, as part of the review, all describe food insecurity. So if that doesn't show that it's an imbalanced um, approach at best to not, for the author or the team not to address it, I think that needs looking at ASAP. Um, have I got two minutes? Yeah, okay, so just to say like, how, you know, change is possible, hopefully, I'm still trying to believe that. And, you know, I just, I created this slide, it's my hopefully most optimistic one, but it goes all the way up from, you know, partnerships that we can create you know, even as social work students up to, you know, senior um, people. Um, I would say that even in my education is something that needs to be looked at as well, because even in my, and this is not to criticize, but in my, you know, arguably forward thinking um, social work masters, uh, you know, food insecurity wasn't mentioned once. Um, and that's, that's an issue. The PCFs, I'm actually, um, thanks to Maris and Wayne, um, we're in the process of discussing how that can be um, introduced in the best way. And it goes all the way up to law, and I'll speak a bit about that later. So I really want to introduce this. So this is something I've designed in the last two weeks, and I hope you can see that it mirrors the idea of micro, meso, and macro. And so food poverty is, as Rashford was um, highlighting, is, you know, the economic issue, and it's around the scarcity of food that you have on, in your cupboard. And so that, that is more on a micro level. Food insecurity, or as I've defined it, um, the living experience of food poverty, is around the... Um, the impact a lack of access to nutrition has on someone's physical and emotional well-being, and also their, their ability to engage with their community. So that's more like a meso level. While food inequality, which I'm introducing today, um, is around calling it what it is, framing food insecurity as an inequality, I think is vital for social work to take the lead on and you know, to call it what it is. And food inequality, um, defining as, uh, you know, the non-equal distribution of resources that isn't experienced in isolation. So just to go back to when I was on placement, um, and I, you know, they, the kids in care were experiencing food insecurity. When I got home, same, um, same um, experience I was having. But it's also coupled with the letters of eviction. Um, you know, the, the bills you can't pay, the pay as you go, gas and electric. And so it's to say that food insecurity is rarely, if ever, experienced in isolation. And so this is why I think 
framing it as food inequality um, on more of the macro level is um, a vital step to make. I've just, I've got a second book coming out next month. Um, there's some great people from Basra in it. Uh, the cost of living crisis are end on, and I'll just say that poor people have been in a cost of living crisis for as long as I can remember, and that it's only now that it's impacting people who are more used to being heard that is getting this coverage. Um, but I think it's amazing that it is. Reach out to me, I've designed a food insecurity training um, for social workers and educators, and it's engaging with a voice of living experience. I will skip, um, because I know time's short. And um, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Hang out, hang out. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for talking about what can be done and leading us into um, the opportunity to hear a bit more about what Bazza is doing. And we'll hear shortly from Kerry, but I just wanted again to kind of frame uh, what Kerry's going to say in a little bit around Bazza's work. Um, poverty and inequality is absolutely central to Baswa's work. Um, it's, it's central to our support to practice, our support to social workers and our work around social justice. And it's very strongly linked to two key priorities within Baswa around um, quality, diversity, and inclusion and around um, involving experts by experience. Uh, so the first thing to say, I think, is that social work and Baswa have a real scope to act and to make a difference. Um, we'll hear from Kerry shortly about some of the ways in which we're doing that. That's partly because we have the motivation. It is part of our purpose as social workers and our ethics, and also part of Baswa's vision to address this inequality. Um, but also because social workers do have a lot of the expertise, particularly when we work in partnership and in co-production, um, we can bring that expertise to bear on this. And there's been decades and decades of work around this. Um, and one of the things that Sue Morris says very, very clearly is that at times, and actually in recent memory, poverty has been tackled. People have been lifted out of poverty and there have been policies that have made that difference. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a, a big element of this which is about the choice. Um, and if we keep working on enabling communities and um, voters and governments and local governments to make the right choice, then we see that and one of the advantages, of course, we have in Basra is that it's a UK-wide organisation. Um, so, I mean, Dominic's coming from a perspective very strongly around England and some of the, the real difficulties that happen in England. But we can also learn from Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales around different approaches. Um, and we can learn from the whole global social work community. So in terms of what social workers can do, Morris highlights the importance of poverty-aware practice and actually gives really great examples in her research of what she calls humane practice. And that comes through strongly as well within our anti-poverty practice guide, which if you haven't come across or haven't used, I really, really recommend. It's developed with practitioners and people with lived experience. And it talks about the importance of firstly respect and making poverty visible, making it visible in the conversations that we have, in the records that we make, in the decisions that we make, in the way that we advocate for people and acting to enlist those networks of support around people um, and particularly around seeing income maximization as getting people money as part of social work practice. But Morris is also really clear that this shouldn't rest on individual practitioners who are feeling the pressure of this and very often experiencing this um, struggle in their own lives. Um, and so that collective action is absolutely crucial to what happens. And again, we see that in Basra. And we see individual members doing great things. We also see groups of members coming together in branches, for example, to make that difference, to, to support food banks, to connect with communities and take positive action. Um, and we also see it on a national and UK level. I just want to give some examples of what BASWA has done in each nation really recently. You can find this if you just go and look in the, in the BASWA news. BASWA Northern Ireland is part of the um, Cliff Edge Coalition. And that coalition has enabled um, as well Northern Ireland not to implement, uh, so Northern Ireland government not to implement the, um, it's acted to, um, to ensure that uh, the Northern Ireland government didn't in implement the Westminster cuts around the bedroom tax and around the two-child cap 
So it's cushioned people um, through that coalition, through that activism against some of those harsh cuts from Westminster. Um, SASWA recently in Scotland has been part of a debate on, on how to reduce drug deaths and has brought poverty into that conversation and being the advocate for poverty there um, and recognising that. Um, Professor Cymru recently been very engaged in the anti-racist action plan um, and is holding a round table on that in which that issue of how poverty overlaps with racism uh, is, come, is really strongly to the fore. And in England, in response to the care review, Basel England has persistently um, advocated that poverty needs to be visible in that work. And we know from what Dominic's been saying, you know, um, it's not visible enough. And that advocacy is going to be really central to what happens in, with that review. So hopefully the things that we've talked about today and what you've heard from Dominic and from Kerry and from, um, from the work of uh, Kate Morris and colleagues is that the individual and collective effort really does make a difference. Um, and as a profession who locates people in their social context, we, I think, have a lead role um, and continue to have a lead role and have always had a leading role in making that social context visible, making poverty visible, um, and working with people with that living experience to change things. So we're going to, I think we might have time just for, to hear for a few comments um, and at least one question for Dominic. So we've had some wonderful, sorry, we've had some great comments online. Um, agreeing that um, it's not a past, um, that the, the, the importance of living experience, not to think of it as something that's past and not a problem anymore, it's an active, ongoing, unending problem. That's Melanie. Kate Online saying, again, such a powerful distinction between living experience and, and, li and lived experience made me think about the language I use around this. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think there was a comment from Amanda Jane saying, keep stripping that wallpaper, I'm off to buy a scraper to stand alongside you. We also have a really um, good a question um, to you. I mean, what, what do you think the, um, the things that you were talking about say about social work, um, about our values and our training as we are at the moment and where we might need to go? Sorry, what was the question? Sorry, I didn't get... The things that you've, you've experienced, what do you think that says about, um, about where social work is at the moment, our values and our training and, and where we might need to go in the future? I think... I don't know if this is on, but... Um, it's on. One thing I've, I think I should highlight is that, like, I've been experiencing these inequalities, like, for as long as I can remember. And I've been a single parent for, it's crazy to think, 16 years now. And it's only when I started studying social work that I kind of learned the language to address these inequalities. I didn't, like, know how to speak about them. And I was really gravitated towards, out of everything, the PCFs that, um, you know, Baz were, um, you know, even as a, as a student that you you learn about. And so I think that there there is amazing steps that have been taken and you should really um, take massive credit for, you know, I'm sure students all around the country from, you know, certain backdrops, are hopefully experiencing it in the positive way that I did. I would just say that there, Poverty shouldn't just be like given a nod to or, you know, poverty exists. The, all the elements of how poverty inflicts on an individual and a family's life need to be looked at. And I think for social work to take a lead on, you know, on the elements of poverty being food insecurity or, as I put it today, food inequality, um, you know, the crippling... Um, benefit system, the threats of homelessness, the pay-as-you-go gas and electric, the, you know, the unfit housing. I think that in terms of like having, having um, that in the forefront of our minds when, when we, I guess, review values and policies and um, frameworks. Thank you. Is that an okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And it's, it's about taking that, um, that knowledge and that awareness and those values that have always been present in social work and bringing them to the fore again. Um, yeah, and it's great to have new voices challenging us and bringing that, bringing that into the front of our minds. Um, I had a response to Carry On Online saying, some, it is, can be hard to keep going sometimes, I'm looking to feel inspired and part of a strong collective by being here today. And I think that sense of collective action community um, is so crucial to, to this when we're so pressured. 
Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. I have a feeling we might be pretty much at the end. Yeah. Um, is there a most urgent pressing question from the floor that we can take just to finish with? Anyone who's like burning to ask Dominic something or to make a comment? Yep. I'm uh, Dr. Nathan Stevens, assistant professor in social work at uh, Illinois State University in the United States. And um, I'm not as familiar with the UK system, but one of the things that I've, I've experienced in the US and working as being a youthful, a youthful recipient of services, as well as now teaching uh, students to administer those services. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on efficiency versus effectiveness. And so a lot of times the government, at least in the US, is about we serve so many, but how well did you keep them in poverty or did you help them break systems or systemic poly, uh, poverty? I don't know if I'm the best to answer it, um, but I would say that, in t I can't speak on the US systems, but yeah, thanks for the question, I should say, sorry. Um, in terms, our benefit system is called now, I was on JSA, but to start studying social work, I had to move to uh, UC, to universal credit because you can't be a student and be receiving job seekers allowance. Um, and why I say that is because universal credit is a dehumanizing system. You, you don't get to um, really speak to a human being. You have to just like enter um, on a like online portal the the challenges or the changes or the hardships you're facing and you just get kind of generic robotic replies um, and also if you're dyslexic and stuff it's it can be hard to kind of articulate um, in a kind of completely non-human I don't know what the right word is but um, yeah it's a broken system uh, universal credit and it was great the 20 pound uplift but like more, way more needs to be done than that. Um, so I think, yeah, the systems do need to be looked at. Thank you for the question again. And I think just for like, it's, I think it's really good for social workers to, you know, be be aware of the of the challenges that people face who are having to survive through these government systems, you know, just to get necessities and stuff. And sometimes have to reach out to charities. And mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you again. Yeah, and I think that does bring us nicely back to that. Um, some of the ideas from Kate Morris around um, effic efficiency being about that fragmentation, just pushing people through, um, and effectiveness being about that humane practice where you actually do make a difference rather than just passing someone, someone along. I think we're out of time, so if I could just um, ask you to thank uh, Kate and Kerry and Dominic for um, all of their input today, and um, thank you for listening.